did you, you're, we're not going to show a presentation, right? I mean, I have um, one if they want. You, I, I will not. Uh, you, uh, you have one that you can show, you can show if you want to show uh, Dr. Hendricks basic presentation. You don't have to take a lot of time on it. But oh, I I ha and I have, and I have that one I've created for these events okay. too. Yeah. yeah. And, and you have access to the full um, sharing capacity. So. Okay. So Jovina, you want us to start or? or go we... for it. Yes. Go for okay, it. Okay. I didn't, I was, <laughs> I was waiting for more of a, more of a handoff there, Jimmy. We, you have to, you, you, you have to uh, practice that. Anyway, as, as was mentioned, my name is Stephen Davis. I'm the director of admissions at Toro University, California. Um, I've been doing this for a while. Dr. Wagner has been doing it for a little while longer than I have. Um, we're both pleased to be here with you this evening. Uh, we will be joined later by a couple of our current students uh, who will be doing a Q&A session. But as students, you, uh, uh, they, they, have, they asked us when they had to be on. And so we told them it was a little bit later. Uh, I'm going to take about 15 or 20 minutes, uh, depending on questions. Just talk about the general process of getting into medical school. Um, I will keep the initial part will be general to most medical schools. And then, of course, I'll tailor uh, my final remarks to getting into Toro specifically. Uh, following that, Dr. Wagner will talk about aesthetic medicine. What are the concepts? What are the ideas? And then again, what, you know, what is Toro about with osteopathic medicine? Um, so uh, first, let me get started. I, I understand from, uh, uh, from Mr. Ashar that um, I had not been planning on talking about the PA program. I saw the question come up from Jamie Shaw. Uh, this was a, a supposed to be a, a forum on osteopathic medicine. Uh, I can, Jamie, we can certainly talk about the PA program if you want to email me. I'll put you in contact with somebody who can, who can discuss that with you. So my understanding is that uh, most attendees uh, in this session are current uh, community college students, uh, but there, there's a mix, so you're all over the place. So um, one of the first things I'd say is, when you consider going into medicine or applying to medical school, becoming a physician, the very first thing you need to look at is, is why do you want to do it? What is appealing to you about medicine? What have you heard? What do you think you know? Um, research your opportunities, research the field. Um, so um, when, you, when you start doing that, you're going to normally, you're naturally gravitate to different things, right? Uh, we've had uh, applicants that have come across that never actually uh, really looked into what it meant to be a physician. Um, so, you know, the very first time they went into an anatomy lab, uh, they, had a, uh, they had a shock. Um, uh, seeing a cadaver. Uh, so, you know, uh, questions I generally ask people, how are you with blood? Uh, you know, it, it, does seeing the side of your own blood cause you to pass out? Well, you, you might have trouble being a doctor. Um, do you like kids? Um, if the answer is no, and you still want to be a doctor, you're probably not going to be looking at pediatrics. Uh, do you like old people? I hope the answer to that is yes. I'm getting to that point. Um, you know, if not, you don't want to go into geriatrics. Um, do you like people generally? If the answer is no, again, being a doctor is probably not for you. But understand what physicians do, both osteopathic and allopathic. So in the United States, uh, Dr. Wagner will go into this more detail. There are two main divisions of, of medicine. Uh, there's osteopathic and allopathic medicine. Allopathic is, is uh, marked by the initials MD or medical doctor uh, after somebody's name. Uh, osteopathic is marked with the letters DO or doctor of osteopathic medicine after their names. Uh, it's interesting. Many people don't pay attention to the letters after their doctor's name when they come into a room. They just see, they just see a name and they don't look. So when you look, when you're in an appointment next time, check. Uh, just Glance at the name tag that your doctor is wearing. You may be surprised that you've been treated by a DO for many, many times, many, many years. Uh, that that is always a possibility. So, when you are looking at applying to medical schools, um, again, DO or MD, the process is very similar, albeit with two different services. The process for allopathic medicine uh, uh, is going to be handled through AMCAS, the American Association of Colleges of Medicine. I think it is. Um, and the uh, application process with uh, for DOs is going to be handled through ACOMAS, the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine Application Service. All long, 
uh, long names, but you can find them on uh, on the internet. Uh, so you're going to be looking at, at applying to through one or both of those institutions. My uh, my general advice for people when they're looking at applying to medical schools before you even start looking at schools, consider the things that are important to you as a potential future student. What are the things that you look for in a school? You're currently attending school somewhere. Um, do you like what you're experiencing? Do you like the way um, the current curriculum that you're experiencing is being taught? Do you like the way the faculty members treat you? Any number of things could come into play. Uh, things such as campus location, uh, reputation of faculty. Um, do you like uh, lectures? Do you like sitting in a lecture hall? Uh, for long periods of time? Do you like more uh, project-based learning or, or case-based learning where you're given a problem that you have to solve? Um, those are things that you need to keep in mind. One of the things that you probably don't want to pay attention to too much is the cost of medical school. Medical school is going to be expensive, whether, you, whether you're applying to MD or DO. There are some scholarships available out there, but by and large, those scholarships disappear when you get into the graduate and professional school uh, level of medicine of uh, education, so you know if everything else is equal, let's say you get you get considered by two schools and everything else is equal, then look at cost because then it makes sense. If nothing else, if everything else is equal, it doesn't matter. And then of course you want to look at what this what the cheaper alternative is going to be. Um, so you know again, what's important to you in in medicine? Now you're looking. The next step is. I have written down a list of things that are important to me. You can, you can rank order them. You can do whatever you'd like to do. Now you're ready to start looking at individual schools. Uh, you're looking at websites. You may be talking to uh, alums. You may be talking to faculty or talking to admissions folks that are paid to talk to you. Um, now you're trying to get an idea of, of all these schools that are out there, what schools do I want to apply to? Uh, understand that the average number of schools that any given candidate applies to is somewhere in the 10 to 15 schools range. Um, so, you know, application processes can be expensive. Uh, my advice when you're looking at schools, again, uh, only apply to schools you're certain you would interview at because your goal is going to be to interview at every school that invites you to do so. That's important because even if, so now let me back up for a minute. So you're looking at schools, um, and you're creating a list, right? Let's just say for the sake of argument, you're going to apply to 10 schools. Doing that, one of those schools should be your, your pie in the sky dream school. So if the sun, moon, and stars align, this is the school that you would go to and that you wanna go to. Two of those schools on the list should be schools you believe you are overqualified for or they have, they accept a lot of people, or they, they, this, that, the other, you have a better chance at, I'll come back to that in a moment. The rest fall out on that, uh, somewhere in that spectrum. It used to be, now I first started 20 more years ago than I want to admit, it used to be that someone who was applying to medical school could apply to a DO program as, I don't know if you've heard the term, as a backup school. So, or, or an MD program as a backup school. This is, you know, uh, Toro is my backup school. If I don't get anywhere else, I, I'll get into Toro. I'm almost guaranteed to get in there. Something like that. Let me be the first to tell you that there is no such thing as a backup school in the medical school application process anymore. Every single medical school out there receives anywhere from between 20 to 40 or 50 applicants per seat that they have available. Um, so you know, there's a lot of competition uh, for getting into medical school. And just because your stats, your metrics, are above what schools uh, post as what, what their average, their average, are, the average they are accepting, doesn't mean that you are guaranteed to get in because the process looks at more than, than those metrics and the GPA and MCAT scores. And we'll get to those in a minute. Um, I will address questions in a moment, so I'm, I'm not ignoring your question. I just want to make sure I don't lose my train of thought because I'm old and that happens. Um, so now you've got this list of, of schools that you want to apply for or apply to. Go for it. 
understand that the application processes for each school generally encompass three different steps, right? So the first step is you're going to submit that primary application, which um, we do tell you is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is either with AMCAS or with ACOMAS. The, the primary application should be viewed as your general approach to the application process. You, generally, why are you interested in medicine? Generally, why do you want to be a doctor? Generally, who are you as a person? That kind of stuff. The second step in the process is going to be the supplemental application step. This is where, okay, you've submitted a primary application to any number of schools. They've looked at your application. They've determined that you satisfy the minimum application requirements they're expecting for people they want to consider. Now they're sending you a supplemental application, which is the second stage, as I mentioned. This is the Y medicine at X school. What is important about X school that you that makes you want to be there? What do you think you can get out of X school? And how do you think X school can contribute to your ability to be a successful physician? It's an important step, right? It's an important distinction. So if you think of it as a funnel, you've got the general uh, primary application, you go down a little bit further on the funnel, now you've got the supplemental application where you're getting more, uh, more specific with regards to what, what they're looking for, uh, for their program. The third and hopefully final step in that process is the actual interview. So now you come in and that funnel gets very narrow because you're in front of them, you're in front of an interviewers, they're asking you specific questions, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a group or what have you, and you get an opportunity to sell yourself. The interview process can be difficult because you're in a situation where you want to talk about yourself. You want to advocate for you getting into that program while at the same time not coming across as as pretty much being rude to everybody else that or anybody else that might be in the process and uh, talking over them. So those are the three steps in the process. If we get more time later, I can talk about the interview um, uh, interview process a little bit more in detail. Um, in terms of uh, in, in terms of minimum qualifications. Um, Again, these will vary by program, but I will. I, I did say I was going to go more into the, the, the Toro process. So at Toro, the minimum application GPAs are going to be a 3.0 science GPA, 3.0 cumulative GPA, and a 500 on the MCAT. Now, the GPAs are calculated by ACOMA, so it's it's whatever numbers they, uh, they calculate will be what we use for that qualifi qualifying uh, look. If you meet those minimum numbers, so 3.0 GPAs, 500 on the MCAT, you're going to be invited to submit a supplemental application. Now understand that uh, achieving minimum levels uh, for GPAs, it's like the cheap seat tickets at a football game, right? So technically you're in the stadium, you can see the game, but you're nowhere near the action. You're, you're all, you always should have a goal to get as far above minimums and as close to averages as possible. So for example, for our most recent entering class, the average GPAs for those we, we ultimately matriculated into the class or those who started last fall were in the 3.5 range and the MCAT was in the 508, 509 range. That doesn't mean that if you fall below those numbers, you can't be successful, but it does mean your, your struggle to get through the process is more difficult, right? Um, so those are the minimum GPA and MCAT requirements. Um, all medical schools have minimum course requirements that they're going to expect. Uh, I want to say like 90% of the schools require some form of, um, I'll get back to that in a minute, uh, Abud, um, have some form of uh, minimum course requirements, uh, whether they call them competencies or they use actual uh, units to, to value that. You'll have to check with their individual websites. Uh, for Toro, we do require eight semester units, generally eight semester units of, uh, of biology, eight semester units of physics, eight semester units of organic chemistry, and eight semester units of gen uh, bio, or excuse me, um, general chemistry. Jeez, my brain's going. Um, there are variations of those specifically for the chemistry series because many different schools are doing different things with their chemistry. So you can look on our website, there's a couple different options. Uh, to uh, to complete that. Um, 
So the question came up with, with the boot. Can I repeat the second step in the application process? That is the supplemental application step, a boot, after you submit the, the primary application, either through a Comus or through um, uh, AMCAS, uh, then schools will invite you to submit a primary or secondary application, which will be more specific to their, uh, their process. So now you've submitted an application, a primary application. You've submitted a supplemental application. Um, you've told us in our supplemental application, because we are an osteopathic medical school, you've told us why you want to get into an osteopathic medical school. Why do you want to be an osteopathic physician? Um, those are the specifics. Remember, the general, I want to be a doctor. The specific, I want to be a, a doctor at a particular school. For us, that's why do you want to be a an osteopathic physician at Toro University of California. Now, one thing I will tell everybody is that um, we are unabashedly primary care and osteopathic medicine focused at our campus. Um, what that means is that you, while you don't need to swear that you'll name your firstborn son after somebody in the osteopathic medical arena, you do need to understand what it means to be a DO. You need to do that research. Preferably, you're going to be out there and you're going to be trying to shadow a DO so you understand uh, what that is. We do not require uh, a letter of recommendation from a DO, but we do, uh, we do expect to see something in your application that shows that you've learned about the profession. So, Mr. Davis, can yes. you tell them what you mean by required versus uh, a, like a mandatory? So what is a requirement? Because that's the about being the bare minimum, right? Yes. So required. Yes. The required is you. We will not consider your application uh, if you don't meet our minimum requirements. So a recommendation. Somebody, yeah. Somebody below a somebody below a 3.0 GPA or below a 500 MCAT we are not going to consider that application. Uh, on top of that, you are required to submit two letters of, uh, two science letters of recommendation from science professors in uh, uh, biological or chemical uh, sciences courses that you took. Those are requirements. Now, in terms of recommendations, uh, on our website, we recommend that you complete uh, biochemistry if you haven't already done it, possibly an anatomy course, uh, but your application will still be considered if you don't do those things. It's just a recommendation that we feel uh, makes transitioning into the program a little bit easier. Um, again, minimum GPAs, recommended GPAs for the best possible chance, probably in the uh, minimally three, 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 four range. Uh, and MCAT recommended probably in the 505 or above range, again, it's not impossible for somebody with lower, what we could refer to as metrics, to get into the program, especially if they have a lot of other experiences in the application that tie into our, uh, to our mission. But it is a more difficult process for them to do it. So for the best possible chances, the recommendation is that you're close to the averages on both those things, uh, in both those areas, and that you have the experience, the, the, the background in knowing you've shadowed a, a DO or you've worked in a hospital, uh, you've done something to gain interest or to gain ex, uh, experience and knowledge about healthcare, about the role of, of a physician, about what a DO does, that kind of stuff. Stephen, I, I might be able to clarify it with one simple sentence. You will not be offered a secondary application if you have not met the requirements. Just because you don't have the recommended things that we'd like to see will not prevent you from getting a secondary or prevent you from getting an interview. We may ask you about it in the interview, but it doesn't prevent you from getting those. But you won't move past the application, the, the primary application phase without the requirements. Is that good? Okay. Um, so now you've done everything you need to do. You've gotten into, you, you've submitted all your, all your required documents. You've met all your requirements. Now you wait and see if you get invited to attend an interview. Um, I do want to put some numbers uh, uh, into your, your minds, just so you know. On, uh, we typically will get somewhere between four and 5,000 applications each application cycle. Uh, so we start each fall. So when I say application cycle, you say each year. Um, of those four or 5,000, we'll end up interviewing somewhere between five and 600 of those who qualify. 
and the class size is 135 seats. So you can see how those numbers shake out. It is difficult, it's not impossible, um, but it does mean that you gotta, you gotta put in some effort. Um, with that, I, I, I think I, I took more time than I had planned on. I will say this, that uh, members of my staff uh, who may respond to inquiries that are sent into us, we are available at any time to answer questions about the program. Uh, so I don't go into a lot of detail on these on these meetings so that a lot of that is, avail is available on our website or we can talk to you uh, individ through individual communications. But I would like to turn the time over to Dr. Wagner to talk about the profession. Oh wait, uh, one, one other question I just got, is it too late to apply to Toro? No, it is not. Um, we, uh, for a number of reasons um, re related to Jewish holidays, we are actually behind the eight ball a little bit right now in terms of our, our admission cycle, but Usually, you'll want to uh, submit an application anytime before February 1st for the best chances of getting into just about any medical school. Okay, I'm going to turn off my camera while I'm here. Uh, Jimmy, did you want me to answer any other questions? Do you want to wait until the end there? Let's just wait until Dr. Wagner is done. Okay. And, and I don't mind being interrupted either, so please feel free. Um, I don't know that we'll even show all these slides, but I'll just just to kind of get you started on, on some stuff. Um, you already know who I am, so that's not an issue. We already told you that. Thank you for having us. We, we love coming to talk. Um, we're gonna talk about TUCOM a little bit. We're gonna talk about what the DO does. And then I'll even share some pitfalls and, and successes that I see um, in the application process um, over the years that I've been doing this. Um, Stephen really told you who we are, but just to give you a little more idea from my perspective as someone who teaches here and, um, oh, sorry, I'm having a mouse issue and it flipped me ahead. All right. Um, anyway, so we focus on graduating, caring, compassionate, empathetic, qualified osteopathic physicians. We have a lot of interest. Our mission talks about community involvement. We are very student-centered. We do have the opportunity for a dual degree option, DO and master's in public health. That can be done in the four years, does not require additional years. It does require some of your summers, but it doesn't require additional years. You can get a certificate in global health. We also have fellowships in osteopathic manipulative medicine, primary care and research. Those essentially are a fifth year um, that is done after the preclinical years are done. And I apologize if you hear weird noises. I'm trying to get my dog to get off my lap and she is feels like she's Velcroed there. So she's snoring. Um, 50% or more of our graduates go into primary care. We have extremely high match rates and we um, have tended to have above national average board scores every, in, in most years. I think this is a big piece, what do DOs do? Um, actually, somebody asked earlier, like other differences. So I'm gonna show you one that's actually minimal, but I'll bet you've never noticed it. Most of you, when you look at the, um, what people call the caduceus, you see the two snakes around the, the center pole. And that is, all, that is associated with allopathic medicine. Osteopathic medicine uses the rod of a scapulus and it's the one snake. Um, and that is, so that has just always been cons uh, consistent with osteopathic physicians. Um, they are fully unrestricted licensed physicians in all 50 states and many other countries and all of our, our all the other properties that are owned by our country. Um, training is focused at identifying health. Finding disease is easy. Identifying health isn't always. Um, DOs are known to have more primary care graduates, family medicine, internal medicine, and pediatrics, though they go into all specialties, including emergency medicine, obstetrics, and gynecology, all surgeries, psychiatry, um, anything that an MD can do, a DO can do. There is also a specialty unique for DOs, which is osteopathic manipulative treatment. It's called neuromuscular medicine and osteopathic manipulative medicine, and MMOMN. And most of, uh, most of our OMM faculty um, are boarded in NMM OMM. One of the things that DOs are, are known for is treating the individual patient in their entirety. Um, so I don't think of my patients as the patient with you know, the hypertensive or the diabetic or the amputee. I think of my patient as John Doe who has hypertension or has diabetes or had an amputation of a, of a leg and I move forward from there. We include all factors that may influence a patient's health and outcomes. And by the way, I am not saying that allopathic physicians don't do this, but I am saying it's something that DOs are trained to do. 
And it's a very big part of our education at, at Turo. I wanted to talk to you all for a minute as some of you may be prepping for doing applications and tell you that copy and paste is not always your friend. You will find yourself copying and pasting things that you really didn't want to say. Um, a common one that we see is um, the reason I want to be an MD is, well, there, I don't really care what the reason you want to be an MD is. You're applying to a DO school and that's not really relevant, right? So being careful just to make sure that your application is for the place that you're, the one you're filling out is for the place you're applying to. Um, everybody's personal statement is their personal reason. But I do want to talk to you about why you, when you're thinking you want to be a physician, please remember that everybody has a relative or a loved one who's had an illness or passed away. That's usually not the real reason you want to do this. That may be a contributing factor, but there's something else that was involved in the course of their illness or the outcome or some other thing that happened. It's not just because you knew someone that had this and you now want to be a doctor. Steve mentioned knowing what osteopathic medicine is. Um, I call it knowing more than Wikipedia. Wikipedia will use words like holistic and mind, body, spirit, which certainly can be used to describe osteopathic medicine. But if you want to impress me with your knowledge of osteopathic medicine, give me an example of how something you currently do shows that you understand the interlinking of mind, body, and spirit, or something that you hope to do in the future and why that really is holistic by describing that entire person approach instead of just using the word holistic. Um, those types of things are what we look for, especially in an interview. Please make sure you do spell check and grammar check. Honestly, you would, we'll tell you, you're probably sitting there when I show you some of these examples, you're going to be like, no, nobody really did that. Yeah, they really did. Um, and Steve gets to laugh because that, that will become sometimes my pet peeve. Um, I, this was one that wasn't all that long ago. I'm applying to Toro. Well, Toro is spelled T-O-U-R-O, -O, not T-U-O. Um, the reason I want to be an MD um, not too long ago, we had one, a student put on their medical school application, attending PA school and helping in my community is, and then they went on to say whatever it was. We also don't want to see you making statements that um, you think are going to impress us, and they're really not valid statements. I recently saw one that said, OMT is the future of medicine. It will replace more conventional medicine. It's been here for over 100 years. It's not going to replace anything. We have been here doing conventional medicine with this additional treatment modalities that we have to offer, this additional perspective. But we are, we are the future of medicine just as all MDs are. Uh, wanting to be a DO just because you want to learn OMT, that's nice, but that's not all that being a DO is. Um, I've seen some people say that DOs are holistic and MDs are not. Please don't say that. Um, not too long ago, one of my allopathic colleagues was on the interview with me and somebody actually said that I cringed and felt terrible for my colleague. Um, and just, you know, when you, when you took care of someone somewhere, something happened that made you want to do it. So just be careful that why you want to be here and why you want to go to Toro and why you want to be a DO. Um, tell us a little bit more about you and not something very superficial. If you get lucky enough to get an interview, and I say lucky enough because this is a big deal, um, when I meet with an inter interview group, the first thing I say to them is congratulations, you've met a major milestone. Can't be a physician without an interview. Uh, make sure you do dress professionally and that you engage, you make eye contact, smile. I'm gonna say, try not to be too nervous. I can't make you not be nervous, I get it. Um, listen to the question and answer what's asked. You will have spent a lot of time prepping for an interview and you'll have things in your head that you're convinced you're going to be asked or things that you're convinced you need to say. Someone will have told you, make sure you tell them this. But if we don't ask you that question that would allow you to tell us this, don't find a way to try and twist your answer into some other question. Listen to what you're asked to make sure you answer it. And if you need a moment to gather your thoughts, you can ask for that always. Try not to read off of prepped notes. Um, or another screen, including cell phones. And yes, it has happened. And as I said, be prepared, you know, do your homework, right? Um, know about osteopathic medicine, know about Toro University, California and Tucum. And I always am telling the candidates, have a question for us. Because when we, when we offer a chance for Q&A, we're getting to know you a little bit as well. 
And I think that's important. Other things to consider when you're prepping for our, your interview, how do some of your life experiences, how will they make you a better osteopathic physician? Can you talk about how your research will lead you to success in your career? Can you discuss a past challenge, how you overcame it and how you'll avoid it in the future? I like saying, if you could change anything in history, what would you change and why? Um, think of a person or in history or a mentor and how that person has influenced you to become an osteopathic physician. So there's a lot of things you can do that aren't those typical questions that you see on, on the student doctor websites. So think a little bit more about how can you show somebody who you are in a very limited amount of time, right? It's, it's, it's asking, you know, my, my curriculum vitae after 30 plus years in practice, I, last time I looked, it's around 10 or 11 pages long. So when somebody like Steven comes to me and says, I need a one paragraph bio, Dr. Wagner, that summarizes your career, that's hard. Think about how you can tell us who you are in a, in a short period of time, because that's an important piece of an interview. Someone has asked me recently, what are keys to success for an osteopathic medical student? Growth mindset. In a growth mindset, people believe that their most basic abilities can be developed through dedication and hard work. Brains and talent are just the starting point. Uh, I love that. I love that statement. If you don't know about being a self-directed learner, read about it, research it, ask questions. But self-directed learning is part of being a physician and it will be for the entirety of your career because after medical school, everything else is done in between seeing patients, but yet you still have to stay current. In the osteopathic profession, we have something called the osteopathic pledge of commitment and professionalism. It's what you will do as a physician in action, word, and deed. You want to make sure you have that. And of course, you do want to know how to be empathetic, be able to define it. These are all things people may even ask you about. Um, I'm not going to go any further because this was the rest of this was prepared for. They wanted a little demonstration of something we do. So sorry, the dog is still. So I will be glad to take some questions or Steve and I can take them together, whatever you prefer. I think one of the big questions was the letter of a recommendation. This has actually been out on a lot of uh, boards that you need to have a DO letter for a DO school. Okay, and so some schools, that's true, Juven. There are schools that absolutely require it. Um, I had a student one time come shadow me and said, will you write me a letter? And the truth of the matter, it was a terrible shadowing experience. It was a horrible shadowing experience. And when I said to this candidate who was shadowing me, so tell me why you want to be the DO, I hope you're all sitting down. The answer was, I don't really, but I didn't get into MD school. You can imagine I wasn't writing her a letter, right? That wasn't happening. And the reality is when I said, I explained why very nicely that I would not feel comfortable writing a letter and that I thought that anything I write might not be very helpful. Um, she actually proceeded to send me two subsequent emails um, telling me how she had to have that letter from me or she wouldn't get her interview at this particular, at this other school. Um, I was just thankful she wasn't applying to Tucom, if you want to know the truth, because I knew that I would not want to have her at our school. But generally, the schools that require it, they often even have lists of people that you can try and ask. We don't require it. We do recommend it. It is obviously helpful if you have met and interacted with an osteopathic physician. This is another question um, that has been asked a lot is um, people have said this is a myth that you need to have 5,000 hours of clinical experience for DO schools. And can you both touch on that? Sure. So that would be a lot. Law and oh power. God. In fact, you know, I I don't know how many, if any, of the DO schools re actually require any specific number of hours of clinical experience. I know we do not, um, and that's there's a number of reasons for that, especially in the uh, the world we live in today. Uh, it's getting to be more difficult to get actual experience, hands-on paid experience in a hospital. And even during COVID, it was, it was much more difficult to, um, to shadow 
uh, any physician, let alone a DO, uh, because there were you know, all the fears about what was going on. Uh, so uh, we don't require any specific number of hours of clinical experience or healthcare experience. What we require is knowledge. We need to be able to see in your app. We need to be able to see in your application that you understand what you're getting into. So, if you want to become a physician first, we have to be able to look at your application and understand that you've done something to know uh, what a physician does and do your deal. The other thing that is, you, again, you need to know everything about the to know what's happening. If you don't shadow a physician, if you don't have a letter of recommendation from a, from a physician, we need to be able to look at your application to see what else you've done to learn about the profession. The worst thing that you can do is apply to medical school without fully understanding what it is you'll be getting into. And I say that because, you know, I, I'm sure you've all heard that medical school is difficult, right? And, and I'm sorry, I, I really don't like the... Uh, the webinar uh, uh, format, because I can't see people. My presentation, I, I like to see faces and I can't, but um, so you'll have to, I'm trying to envision what you look like. Uh, in any event, um, you need to, as I said, you need to know what you're getting into. You don't want to show up to medical school and say, oh, suddenly I don't want to do this. And that happens. You know, there is a tremendous amount of expense in blood, sweat, tears, and money that go in for to you getting into medical school. Uh, so if you don't know what, what it is about, if you don't know what the whole thing will require of you, then that first week is going to be absolute hell. Absolute hell. Um, you know, if you think most, if you think about it for a moment, most full-time students in college are enrolling in somewhere between 12 and 15 units, semester units of coursework each semester. Okay. Okay. Um, in medical school, you're enrolling in 20 to 28 units of coursework in a given semester. So almost twice as much in, case, in some cases for what you'd be doing in, in undergraduate. And everything in medical school is cumulative, meaning that you learn a concept and then you learn concepts that depend on that concept, on that knowledge. So... It's, it's not as if you go into one class, you learn that information, and you're done with it for the rest of your time in, in, in that, at that school. Everything builds on everything else. Um, some examples I use, you know, when, when, when we're in person, when I'm giving presentations, I, I, I try and pick people that are around maybe, uh, you know, five foot five, five foot eight, somewhere around that, that height. And I bring them up to the front of the room. And I point out how, how tall they are. And then I point out the number of textbooks that are required on average for uh, one semester in medical school. So again, five to, to, to six or seven different courses. Each of those courses are going to require three to four, to require now three to four textbooks and recommend another two or three, depending on the, on the subject matter. So you've got for five courses, Three required texts. Let's just keep, keep it simple. So 15 required textbooks, another possible 15 uh, recommended textbooks. It's a ton of material. You're, dating, heard, you're dating yourself, Mr. Davis. I know, I know, I know. I don't I know. buy textbooks anymore. Yes, I, I'm getting that. Our it's students the, don't buy textbooks. It's the visual I'm going for. Yes, it's I, not the, I get it. I don't want them to think they're going to have to go buy books. Yes, it's a lot of material. Uh, it's been it's been equated like trying to take a sip out of a fire hose. Uh, don't try that, by the way. You lose your half your face. Um, it's difficult, but it is doable. It requires dedication. It requires understanding. It requires sacrifice. But my point with all of that is, if you don't know what you're getting into, it's going to take you and and just wash you away. So. That's that's important, uh, Jim. And I think I, I hope I answered that question. Great. Think, so, Stephen, there's one. So, somebody put something in, in the in the question and answers, and and uh, so, Kumi, the one thing I would say is I understand completely that working as a behavioral tech with patients and children on the spectrum um, gives you a lot of ideas about patient interaction. So, what you'd want to do is say why that was enough for you to understand. 
about medicine. You'd want to be able to give a couple of examples that also while this happened, somebody, uh, you know, you've had students who have reactions or, you know, patients who have this, or you want to be able to show us, would you really pick a career that is going to take you away from your loved ones? for birthdays and holidays and weddings and anniversaries, a career that's going to cause you to potentially bring germs into your home, not intentionally, but it happens because you're taking care of them and not know what that's about and what it's like because you're going to do it forever. So I think what Stephen is saying is you don't want to go into anything. You don't know what it is. And by the way, I say that to current medical students when they're trying to pick a specialty, go work with somebody and really get a sense of what a day in the life of, because that's when you really get to see what we do. Yeah, uh, you may. You, the, the reason medical schools have a, a, a number and variety of rotations in your clinical education experience is because you may come into medical school thinking, you know, I love kids. I want to be a physician. I want to work with young kids. And then you have that first rotation where you get peed on, pooped on, thrown up on, all the other ups on. And you decide, you know what? I, I would, no longer want to work with young kids <laughs> because that's. I just don't want to deal with that. So it's all the experience. You gain general experience before you get before you apply to medical school and you get additional experience as you go through the process, which helps you select different things and areas you might be interested in. The, the next question says, can you this is up? actually I was going to ask you this one. This is actually a good one on shadowing is um, do you, uh, how does uh, one develop a good relationship and chattering with the doctor, do you treat them as a friend or maintain professionalism? Yes. The answer is yes. Um, so what I'm telling you is it's both. Um, it is being yourself and letting me get some insight into who you are. So, um, you know, being willing to talk and, and interact, it's also behaving professionally. What I would always would discourage me if somebody is shadowing is if they cower back in the corner and never come forward. What do I love in a shadow? When we walk in that patient's room and I say, I've got a, a student shadowing me today because they want to be a physician. Um, I love it when that shadowing student reaches forward. Now, of course, we haven't done a lot of handshaking during COVID, but prior to COVID, when we shook hands all the time, reaching forward and saying, hi, my name's John. Thank you for letting me in, uh, observe doctor take care of you today. What that tells me that you are engaging with my patient. And I have had patients ask the shadowing students questions. Well, how long before you get into medical school? Uh, you know, and so all of a sudden it becomes an interaction. Um, you have to kind of get an idea of what the doctor wants. Maybe ask, how much do you want me to engage or not engage with your patients? You may be with someone who'll say, you don't talk to them at all. You're just standing with me. And, and so you need to honor it. Um, but I would say the answer is yes, be yourself, but also still be professional. I've had people show up to shadow wearing jeans. That's not the right attire to shadow in. This is my professional practice. You don't show up in jeans. Um, so I think that it's just under, it's, it's reading about shadowing experiences and then asking. I'd have no problem if somebody said, what should I wear? But I would never just show up somewhere, you know, for example, in jeans or flip-flops or something like that. So I think you just want to talk. You want to have a little interaction with that person you're going to shadow so that you can do what they expect you to do. I'll yeah, take the, that. The only, yeah. thing, the, uh, the only thing is I would add is um, the, the dressing up professionally, it's really important uh, because you're not only representing yourself, you're representing that physician and their patient. And it's also about the patient. So if the patient walks in there and sees somebody, pardon my French, shows up as a dress as a hobo, they're not going to have a lot of confidence in the facility they're at. The other part of it, too, being a friend and professional, um, I work with a lot of doctors and I call them by their first name, but in front of a patient, in front of family, you don't address them by their first name. Um, it takes a while to, to get to that pain. You always address them in a professional setting. Now, most of the physicians I know, is I see them inside the hospital and not outside, but you just have to know you don't address them by their first name. A lot of people say, well, call me by my first name, but that doesn't mean in front of a patient or family, you say, hey, Joe, you know, what's up or whatever. You have to maintain that. But again, it's because of the patient and set. So I'm sorry, Mr. Davis. That, that's okay. I was going to take that the next question from the anonymous attendee. Um, yes, Emily. 
I was going to take that one. Okay. Uh, you can t- tell me if I get something wrong. <laughs> you got it wrong. <laughs> so um, for DO, th- there are two different sets of licensing exams uh, in the United States. One is USMLE, predominantly for MD or exclusively for MD schools, and some DO students will take the USMLE. And then there is the um, COMLEX, which is the exam- a licensing exam for DOs. Um, you, as a DO student, if you er, as a future DO student, if you attend DO school, will take are required to take the COMLEX. You may choose to take the USMLE depending on where you're uh, trying to secure residency or uh, some other factors that uh, can be reviewed at, at a later point. I want to point out, however, that there's a lot of questions about um, a lot of concerns, rather, about uh, from prospective applicants about licensing exams, and uh, one of the best responses I've heard happened very recently from one of our, uh, from our senior associate dean who was giving a presentation earlier this week and I told him I was going to steal it. But when asking about studying for, when he was asked about studying for the COMLEX or the other, other licensing exams, his response was trust and in, trust in and engage in the curriculum. The curriculum is designed to give you the information you need to be successful as a a, a, a new physician, as well as to be successful in your licensing exams. Where we find that students run into trouble is when they dedicate more time to sources outside of the curriculum to prepare for the licensing exams instead of trusting in the curriculum. Am I trusting in the curriculum? I said, it's designed. The, the, the material your faculty are going to give you to, and teach you in the courses, that's specifically designed to aid you in being successful on these, on these exams. So um, I, I hope that answered your question. Dr. Uh, Wagner, do you want to add anything? Oh, I was going to say that actually comes directly from the mouth of uh, recently Dr. John Gimple, who is the president of the NBOME, which is the, the COMLEX exam group. Um, when He said when he's asked at multiple schools this that question, his answer is the number one way that you will pass the boards is to learn your curriculum. And he felt very comfortable saying that um, out in the open. We can also get through, we don't require research experience, a research experience when applying to our program. It's nice if you have some, but it's not a requirement. But if um, you've done it, make sure you talk about it. The right. other thing is, I just want to ask about boards and stuff is this is always comes up. And, and this is something that I know a lot of my friends that have gone through Turo. So it's not like I'm not, no, Mr. Davis hasn't paid me, but um. <laughs> Um, they have a vested interest in you passing your board. So it's not like undergraduate that they put you out there and say, all right, survival of the fittest. Um, they have invested a lot of time in you, um, a lot of money, a lot of efforts. And so they will make sure that you pass. I actually had a friend who went to Turo who was really struggling and come to find out that she had a learning disability that she didn't know. And so they've worked with her and stuff. So they have a vested interest in you to do well. And um, so it's not like undergraduate, they say, do whatever you want to do. Um, the, another, in, so, yeah. I, I, I would agree. I, I, in fact, I do want to say that, you know, I, I mentioned earlier how hard it is to get into medical school. Um, if, and it's sometimes a big if, if you engage in the curriculum, if you dedicate and put in the time, it is equally hard to fail out of medical school because we've all given that so much effort to get you in, we want to keep you in. There are a number of support services that we, that we have on, on our campus and, mo- and all medical schools do to some degree or another to help you be successful in the program, from academic counselors to mental health counselors to uh, tutors to different open office hours uh, to different presentations, all designed to help you be successful. Again, it's a lot of effort to get you in and a lot of effort to, to keep you there for both us and you. Uh, the question, do you require research experience when applying to your DO MPH program? Again, no, the research is not required. On the research question, I do wanna point out that it is okay to apply without research mm-hmm. for Toro. It is okay to apply without research. Do not get into the, the, the mindset that your box checking. So, oh, I've heard that medical schools need research, so I'm going to go do a semester of research here. I'm going to do this thing here. I'm going to check that box, check that box. Do things because you truly find them interesting, not because you think we want to see them. 
That's that goes for shadowing. That goes for any of your experiences. That goes for research. Um, and I say that because one big factor in applying to medical school and being successful in that process is passion. Um, I can ask you a question and and know within five seconds if you are passionate about a topic because you're going to lean forward. Your eyes might get a little bit wider. You're going to get more animated. Your hands are going to move, do stuff, do stuff like that. Um, so if I'm asking you about a research experience and none of that happens, you're just giving me the, the down and dirty facts that are already in your application, I can know at that point that research really did nothing for you. You were doing it because you thought I wanted to see it, but in terms of influencing your desire to become a physician or ultimately your future desire to, to conduct research, it did nothing, you know? When I ask about an experience, I want to know how has that touched you? How has that influenced your, your path? Did it nudge you one way or another? Did it, did it teach you, hey, I really don't want to do this? All experience is good experience, provided you're able to talk about it and show us that it meant something to you. So in other words, there was one other question, Jubin, that I wanted to address. I answered it. It was a Northern California preference, and I answered it in writing. Oh, well, well, well fine. No, there was a question. The, the question earlier was, should you ap only apply to medical schools in states where you want to practice? Oh, yeah, I answered that a long time you ago. You answered that? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. The, the thing is, the, the only two questions I wanted to address is um, the grading system, because I think that a lot of people wouldn't want to know that, and okay. preference for California students at Northern California or... So we have no geographic preference, Juven. We uh, the, the reality is over 80% of our students are from California. Some years, I think it approaches 90. Um, but that's who applies to our school. But we don't, you don't get like extra bonus points because you are from California um, or because you're from Northern California. Um, we do love looking at people who are from the area and that does encourage us that they would want to stick around, but it's not something that's a guaranteed, um, something that gives you extra credit for applying. Um, we are a pass fail school. Um, we still look from day to day at grades within the courses, but every transcript is gonna be pass, no pass. The reason we look at grades is that thing that you referred to, which is our academic support teams. Because if somebody was just always getting a pass, a pass who is at a 70 when 70 is passing and a pass who is sitting around 90 are two different students. And we may need to give some other resources and work with the student who is sitting at the 70. And so we do look from day to day within the course at grades because that's how we know who needs help. But the transcripts all say pass or no pass. And that's all the residencies will say. Does I'll, that I'll take the next two quickly so we get to our students. Um, so uh, we do not currently consider international students to, to, to define that. If you are in the United States on any type of a visa, you're qualified as an international student, and we are not able to consider that application uh, right now. Our sister campus, you know, sister program in New York is able to consider international students if you want to go to New York. Uh, so, and, and several other medical schools obviously do consider international students. We do not at, at this point. There's a number of reasons that I won't get into on that, but we do not. Um, advice for community college students who want to study med, what should they do as early as possible? First and foremost, focus on your grades. Focus on doing well in the courses that you're taking. One of the most common barriers I see in, in applicants that come in is an early struggle in science, in the sciences. You know, I'm not talking you miss a, a course or two here or there. That's not, a, that's not the problem. But if you have a solid year of below average academics, it can be very difficult to surmount that and get your GPAs up to where you're competitive without going into some type of a post-baccalaureate program. So first and foremost, focus on your grades. Um, second, if your grades are solid, start looking for different experiences. 
Uh, it can be as simple as volunteering at a local hospital, volunteering at a hospice center, um, working in the community. All of those experiences help you get out and just interact with, with people around you. Um, those are probably the two most important things I'd say while attending community college uh, courses. When you get into, um, or, or any possible um, uh, clubs that are that are uh, in the community college, I think those are, are fewer. When you get into a four-year institution, then you can look at expanding a little bit more, some additional clubs that'll start popping up, some additional experiences, uh, looking into more targeted coursework for medical school. Uh, those, that's pretty much what I would say uh, right now. Uh, I'm the, the housing. We we do not have university sponsored housing uh, that is available in the area from a number of different uh, landlords, uh, but we don't have university sponsored housing. And with that, um, I'm going to let our wonderful students talk and introduce themselves because they can do that much better than I can. They are rock stars. Period. End of discussion. Mic drop. Go for it, rock stars. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Sally Kanyame. I'm a second year medical student at Toro, California, and I'm also currently the VP of Admissions for our College of Osteopathic Medicine Student Executive Council, which you may have heard, um, it's across different DO schools with a shorthand as ComSec. Um, so I'm heavily involved in pre-med mentorship, as well as sitting on the admissions committee, doing interviews, training students for that aspect of things. I'm super excited to answer any questions that I can and be a resource for you all. And with that being said, I'll hand it off to Sefa. Hey Sally, hi everyone. My name is Huzefa. I'm also a second year med student here at Toro. Um, I think probably the biggest way that I can uh, give advice is that uh, on my way to getting to med school, I actually was a community college student um, out of high school. Um, so hopefully I can give you guys some insight into uh, how that was for me and um, what I, what kind of steps I took uh, to getting into med school. And uh, thanks again for having me. So somebody wants to know what are the qualities uh, when you were looking for med school, what qualities were you looking for and which ones did you find at Turo? So I can start off with this. Um, a big one for me, well, a couple big ones for me were um, location, community, and along with that community outreach, whether that be um, community within the school and then community outreach that university did with the surrounding um, county or city that we were located in. So location wise was because my family has always been in the Bay Area. I grew up over here. So it was um, an area that I have near and dear to my heart, as well as the community um, in the surrounding area. I really wanted to be a resource and work in both in medical settings and non-medical settings. Um, I did my master's program at Toro as well. So I went high school, undergrad, master's at Toro, and then medical school. Um, so I had a really good insight of what the community was like at the university as a whole, um, how reachable and um, how easy it was to discuss different topics and just have face-to-face -face conversations with the faculty um, and really just go off of any feedback that you get or any feedback that you might give somebody else, like one of the faculty members about a class or whatever it may be, if you're struggling in something, or even if you just want to get to know those around you, whether it be your peers and your colleagues, or again, faculty and professors. Um, so that was a really big thing for me because I wanted a community-based education. Um, I wanted to be able to reach out to people. I wanted to be comfortable talking um, both to my superiors and people that were on the same level as me. Uh, I can jump in here. Um, so there's just a few things that I, I wanted to add for me personally. Uh, of course, location, I think is a big thing. Um, I'm also from California, uh, but I'm from uh, Los Angeles originally. Uh, so, uh, you know, at least it's a little bit close for me, right? I'm just a one hour flight away. And so that's something definitely to consider is that it's relatively easy for me to get home if I want to be. Uh, um, and also, I just, you know, I'm used to the California environment, and it's nice to be here. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention um, was that uh, definitely take a look at the, uh, you know, the school itself and, like, the kind of curriculum that they have, the kind of culture that they have at that school. I think one of the things that definitely sold me about Toro that I really, that I continue to like now um, is that we, we have a, a pass-fail uh, curriculum. And I feel like that kind of takes the pressure off being, you know, ultra competitive when it comes to taking exams. Or if I can just get 
uh, if I can do pretty well in exams, um, then I can focus my time on uh, not only just doing other extracurricular things, um, you know, whether that be like research or being part of clubs, um, but I can also just focus on my own well-being. If I want to go to the gym, um, if I want to have some time out with friends, um, then I can do that too. And I think having, you know, a good, having good mental health is definitely very important because uh, it's going to be a lot of hard work. And so <clears throat> you want to make sure you have time to reset. And of course, you know, um, some med schools can be extremely competitive. Um, so I think that's definitely uh, something to consider. So I'll go ahead and take the next question and then the one following regarding community college. I'll let Huseba take because he was a community college student and I was not. So the first question is, did any of you take a gap year before applying to medical school? And if you did, what was the most important experience that you had during your gap year? So I did take a gap year. I took two, actually. Um, so I went straight to a four-year college. I went to a state school in Monterey, which is in California, um, right after high school. And then following that, I took about two years off. I spent around eight months doing um, preclinical research and then about another seven to eight months doing clinical research. Uh, from there, I really wanted to get back into the educational setting. I really wanted to take the additional steps to eventually matriculate into medical school. Um, but I didn't feel like my application, whether it be my experiences or my academic Academic profile was strong enough to apply um, as a competitive applicant with how difficult it is and how many students are applying each cycle. So that's why I decided to do the master's program at Toro. Um, I answered this question through typing, but I did the master's in medical health sciences at Toro um, and then applied, interviewed, and matriculated to ToroCom uh, California as well for medical school. So I think the biggest thing that I got out of my gap years was really real world experience. Um, for me, it was important to get some life experience under my belt, um, be more independent, whether that be from working or financially independent. Um, but I needed to have something that I could kind of leave my youth, uh, whether it be high school or college, that type of mindset and really kind of be on my own two feet, figure out what I wanted to do and how I was going to succeed on my own and kind of navigate through all those different obstacles. And then Hussein, I'll let you take the next one and then we can go from there. Cool. Um, actually, kind of answer, kind of just answer two questions here because I not only went to community college, but I also did take a gap year. Um, so I went to community college right uh, out of high school. Um, and to be honest, I didn't get into any of the colleges that I applied to, which is why I ended up going to community college. Um, and it's totally possible that some, some of you may be in that same position or not. Um, but if, if I'm proof of anything, then uh, going to community college is, is a great option for anyone, really. Um, first of all, you don't pay tuition, really. I mean, you do a little bit, but compared to four-year universities, um, I mean, it's almost negligible, which is definitely a great thing. Um, and I think the best thing about community college is you really just kind of get to focus on school. You just focus on school, maybe you get a job, um, and you just focus on those kind of things. Um, as far as transitioning to a four-year school, I will say that um, I think community college was, uh, at least from an academic point, um, a little bit easier than four-year college. Um, I transferred from community college after two years to UCLA. Um, and my first quarter there, it was a bit of a shock, um, especially academically. Uh, it was very competitive. Um, and, you know, I guess I was like pitted against my classmates kind of. Um, so I think it's just something to be aware of. I kind of got a little bit lost a little bit in um, the whole social aspect. And I think that kind of made my grades slip a little bit. Um, so what I would say is uh, just be prepared for that. It's impossible for me to tell you that, you know, there's one formula to uh, success. Um, but just keep that in mind and make sure that, that you know, definitely enjoy your time when you, when you transfer over to, to a four-year university. Definitely um, enjoy that experience, but keep in mind that you got to keep focused um, on the academics uh, because you can have every possible, um, you know, research experience or um, club experience or volunteering experience. Um, but the at the end of the day, you need to make sure your grades are strong. That will definitely save you a lot of uh, hassle and trouble um, going forward. Um, and that is ultimately uh, one of the reasons why I ended up doing a gap year uh, after I graduated uh, was because I kind of wanted to beef up my application. Um, and I also wanted a little bit more time to get down some clinical experience and, and things like that. 
Um, I did a program in, in California. It's called uh, KGI or Keck Graduate Institute. Um, and it was just a one-year program. It helped me take a couple of, I guess, like you could say like advanced classes um, related to medicine. Um, and then it also gave me some time to be a scribe and get some clinical uh, experience. Um, besides that, I took one more gap year and I just worked um, as a healthcare consultant, just any job. And that actually helped me a lot because uh, I, I saved that money and it really helped me pay for rent through my first year. Um, and so definitely, I would, there's nothing wrong with taking a gap year. I think, you know, honestly, most of my classmates, I would say I've taken at least a year, maybe. Um, so that's tending to towards the norm, I would say these days. So there's definitely nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in that. Um, and I think it's a really great option for, for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, definitely, uh, definitely just make sure you, when you transfer to a four-year university, make sure to, to focus on academics. Um, but you know, uh, have fun, but definitely keep that in mind. Um, before jumping into the next question that's in the chat, I did want to just kind of piggyback off of what Hussein was mentioning about um, not attaching a negative stigma to taking a gap year or taking a, an alternate route to what you may think or what the internet may think or whatever it may be the traditional route to medicine is or to medical school. Because at the end of the day, if this is a career that you really do want to pursue, if this is a passion that you've had, um, whether it be throughout your entire life or within the last couple of years or after you got your first hospital or patient interaction experience, if this is truly something that you want to pursue and be doing for you know, a large duration of your life and your entire career from here on out, um, you will get to that point. Um, you might have to take a side step. You might have to take a step back, go a different um, route to overcome various obstacles. But at the end of the day, those are all unique to you. And those are all things that you can discuss in your application and your personal statement and really let different schools know who you are as an applicant, a student and a person in general. Um, so just keep that stuff in mind as you're going through. I know as a pre-med, it feels like it's a never ending process, but a good thing I always remind myself is that everything does come to an end. A class you hate is going to come to an end. Um, your job experience that you're not thrilled about will come to an end, as well as being a pre-med if this is something that you truly do want to do. So with that being said, I'll move on to the next question. Um, it is asking about the cost of living in this area, um, housing availability near the school, and if you need a car, if you do have to live far due to cost. So as Mr. Davis previously mentioned, we don't have residential um, student housing on our campus, but what we do have is a neighboring community, um, residential housing and condo types of uh, living situations that are on Mare Island. So what Mare Island is, is it's a literally a little island um, that's adjacent to Vallejo and there's two little bridges that come onto it. Um, and within walking distance, like a couple of minutes or like a 30 second drive, you have tons of housing opportunities on the island, which we kind of call on campus housing, even though technically it's not. Um, that's really beneficial because you're able to run home in between classes if you want. You have a very easy commute that you don't have to think twice about. Um, you don't have to wake up earlier and deal with traffic, things like that. Um, also, it's a very good advantage if you want to live in a house that is filled with students, um, whether it be in the comm or uh, different colleges within Toro, California, whether it be pharmacy students, PA, um, first, second year comm students, et cetera. Um, so we have a platform called Campus Groups that different landlords will, um, and, and students that are leaving on rotations will post open housing. And, and you're really only worried about that one room that you're renting. Um, and it's a much more, I think, lower stress environment when you need, you know, you have to worry about breaking a lease, things like that. Um, but another option is just living in Vallejo, California and not on Mare Island, which is what I do. The reason that worked best for me was because um, I already had a house full of people from my master's program that I wanted to live with uh, while attending Calm, And so it was just easier to fill an entire house living about 10 minutes away from campus. I think whether you live on Mare Island or off of Mare Island, whether it be 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes away, what have you, you do need a car because there is not really like a college town type of situation on the island within walking distance to um, the campus. So you would either need to live with somebody that did have transportation um, or you would need to have that yourself just to kind of make things a little bit easier and, and overall doable. Um, 
Cost of living can be a little bit higher depending on where you're coming from. We are in the Bay Area, but we are in California in general, but we are a smaller city on more of like the outskirted area of the Bay Area. So we're not talking about like San Francisco, Berkeley, Oakland type of rent. Um, but I think it usually runs between like five to eight hundred uh, for students renting out a single room, just depending on like how small of a room, if you're sharing a bathroom, if you're sharing a room um, and all of those options will be listed out for you upon um, given the opportunity to matriculate and all of that. So there's definitely a wide range. Uh, do you want me to get the next one? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Okay. Um, just for anyone who's curious, um, I pay 840 a month uh, for rent, just to give you an idea. And I live in a house with uh, three other guys who are also all in the same program. Um, and we all roughly pay about the same. So just to give you uh, just a little perspective, I would say. Um, and to answer the question about MCAT studying, um, so, I mean, it's obviously gonna differ for different people. Uh, for me, for example, I took an MCAT course over the summer before I took uh, the MCAT. Um, what I will say is that if you need something to, I guess, like force you to uh, force you to sit down and study and have a schedule and have structure, then I would say take a class. Like if you can, if you can afford to take class, I would definitely do that um, because it keeps you accountable. Um, some people have no problem self-studying and they have no problem making their own schedule and sticking to that. Um, I just know myself and I'm just not that kind of person. Um, so that's kind of how um, I would uh, that's kind of how I would uh, take, you know, that's kind of my approach to the MCAT because I've seen people be successful with either way. Um, so I think you just need to uh, be honest with yourself and think like, hey, can I really hold myself to this or do I need a class to force me to do it? For, in my scenario, it was a class that forced me to do it. Um, and I took one class over the summer and I took the MCAT one time. Um, and that was, uh, that was good for me. Um, as far as tips, uh, at the end of the day, the MCAT is really just uh, reading comprehension. Um, you know, whether it's the science section, like whether it's chemistry, physics section, or if it's uh, psych psychology, sociology se uh, section, um, they really are just reading comprehension. And I don't think you need to take like any extra classes per se um, outside of your prerequisites um, to have the necessary knowledge to uh, know the material on the MCAT, if that makes sense. Um, Everything that you would that you would have to take anyways as part of your prerequisites will, will cover um, that material. Um, but that's that's my perspective. I can add a little bit onto that as well. I think um, one of the downfalls of the MCAT, and there really is no way around it, is the financial burden of it. So the test itself costs a lot. The classes, whether they be self-paced online courses through Kaplan or Princeton, or the in-person classes that you're able to attend and engage in, like Huseyfa was mentioning, all of those do cost a significant amount of money. Um, and I think the only way to really get around having to do that in a small finite amount of time is giving yourself time to study um give yourself time to learn how the mcat is worded which is the reading comprehension part that was mentioned um, you have seen the material as you're studying it you're going through practice problems you're going through rationales of why you got questions wrong or right but at the end of the day you've seen the material nothing is going to be brand new to you but it's really just your interpretation um, the approach I took to studying for the MCAT was more question-based. I had a hard time sitting down and just like studying for hours out of one of the Kaplan books or, you know, the various sections that I had. Um, so I kind of held more onto the Q banks. Um, I use UWorld as well as the AAMC ones. And then just doing those practice problems and um, practice the full length practice tests in a time setting manner um, and just trying to emulate that real world, real test taking experience that you're gonna get on test day. Um, I say this a lot to like really anyone that comes in to discuss things in our info sessions with admissions, but how you studied in high school will be different from college. How you study in college will be different from grad school. And even that will be much, much different from medical school. And it's the same approach with the MCAT. Um, you've gotten to the point where you have the ability to even study for it or take it. So you have a very high knowledge base of these brute sciences. Um, 
it's really just allowing yourself time to study for it and to retain and really understand the material. Um, so quality over quantity with your applications as well. You want to make sure that you're allowing yourself to experience your experiences, um, which sounds kind of cliche, but really getting something significant out of them. Um, and it's really the same with MCAT studying. The more you understand what you're learning and what you're studying, the more you'll, uh, it'll be able to stick with you why you got things right or wrong. And that will even travel on to your skill set for medical school. Uh, yeah, I just want to add one more thing too, which is that, um, you know, there's so many different ways that you can study for the MCAT and so many different courses. Um, the one thing I will say is that I think one of the best resources is the AMC itself, because they have, I think you can buy, um, you can buy practice sets and you can also buy five uh, practice exams. And uh, what I would recommend is that if you are a couple weeks out from your MCAT, uh, is that you take those practice tests, uh, those practice exams as the last thing that you take, because those will be the best representation um, of the exam. I know that, you know, like Kaplan and Princeton, they have their own uh, exams that they offer, uh, but the AMC exams will be the closest approximation to the exam itself. So I would save those until the very end um, when you're ready to take the exam. This is um, uh, one question. Oh yeah, I was just gonna um, reiterate that one. How many months did you study for the MCAT, who say with or without your class? Oh, um, so my class was within the summer. So it was roughly I spent uh, three months to study uh, for the MCAT. Um, you know, it's gonna vary uh for each person uh the one thing i will say about the summer that's nice is that i didn't have any classes or anything to worry about that was my only focus was just the mcat um and so i think you know probably about i think three months is just about enough time to get it done um if you're in school then that's something that you could be doing throughout the semester and maybe you could take two semesters doing that um, but I think if you can find a time like the summer to do it, I think that's the best time because uh, it's a really important exam. And uh, if you can just lock in and give it your best possible shot, all your energy, um, then I think that's definitely worthwhile because that's going to go um, definitely a long way for your application. You know, even if you have some, you know, maybe you had like a bad grade here and there. Uh, but if you can get a really good MCAT, then that can definitely open some doors for you. So uh, that, that's what I recommend. Um, I'd also like to add that if you, so he's discussing three month study period fully engaged over the summer period. If you are in class, if you are taking, you know, prerequisites or whatever it may be, if you're working, you really do need to allow yourself a more lengthened period of time because, you know, studying for eight hours, you know, five to eight hours a day completely focused is going to be a lot different than studying two hours when you get home from work. Um, and really just setting yourself uh, reasonable timelines because you still you don't want to get burnt out from studying. Um, you want to be able to retain the information. My MCAT studying length is a little bit more of a difficult question because I was scheduling and unscheduling my MCAT all through like the peak of COVID because all my testing centers kept getting shut down. Um, so I studied in a lot of different chunks of time. I did it where I was able to be fully engaged for a little bit. I did it while I was working and I was studying like after work or maybe a little bit before. Um, sometime when I was in school, I was studying. So um, I had a little bit more of a non-traditional and chaotic route of studying for the MCAT. Um, at the end of the day, it did work out but just keep all of those things in mind that life will happen life doesn't stop just because you are studying for the MCAT or even if you're in graduate or medical school um so be able to kind of roll with the punches and and give yourself that leeway for and either and of you for either of you did practice tests play a significant role in your in your preparation yeah, for me, I think that was one of the biggest things. Um, I will swear by practice examinations, the full length ones, as well as um, question banks, whether it be UWorld or AMC. Um, those were the things that I think you are able to see, like, why I got this wrong. You're able to see if you have a trend in the type of questions or the subjects that you're getting incorrect. Um, but specifically, the practice exams that are in the full length are, are so beneficial because one of the largest hurdles to get over with the MCAT is sitting there for six to seven hours. You know, you have your breaks, you have your lunch period, but being able to be focused during that time and not um, 
fiddle with stuff, not get up and go have lunch downstairs, you know, because you're in your home rather than in a testing environment. Uh, so I think that was the biggest takeaway from me. Yeah, and I think one of the just biggest thing is we have somebody who's going to spend about three and a half hours going over the MCAT and every part of it. But the other part of it, too, is that every person is an individual. So if you struggled through OCHEM and physics, um, you may have to spend a little bit more time reviewing. Or if you're um, smart like uh, Josefa, you could only do it in three months. So some people have different abilities and different preparations. So just because it worked, for, or someone like Sally who took it in different chunks, some of us may have ADHD and or have forget everything. So everybody's very different. And the whole point of four years of college is that you learn how to study besides learning all these different stuff. So you should make that assessment for you and for your life because you know some people you know some people are just you know some 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 of us are not as smart as others. Can I can I add there? So I I, I you know when you consider high stakes exams uh, in your life, the MCAT is the highest stakes exam you're going to face before you get into medical school. It plays, I, I wish it didn't. I honestly wish it didn't, but it still plays a, a fairly significant role in your path to getting into medical school. So as, as both uh, student Dr. Ken and I, student Dr. Moyes said, plan your time dedicate time to studying for the MCAT, unopposed time. If that means that you have to um, separate yourself temporarily from boyfriend, girlfriend, significant other, you know, spouse, kids, um, find a quiet place to study at least a couple hours a day uh, on, on that material. Because if you, you know, preferably medical schools want you to have your best MCAT score the very first time you take it one and done, and you're in. The reality is, for some people, that doesn't work. And, and I'll tell you why. Because no matter what I say about how important that exam is, or how much time you should dedicate, and what you should do, or what your counselors say, and everybody else, um, you won't do it. And so you'll take the exam, you won't get the score you want, and now you're, you're one in the hole. Now it's it, it's it's much more important to study for that, and you have to work on it. So give it the time it it, it needs. There is nothing more important at that time than doing well on that exam. So take the time. The score is good for three years. Do whatever you have to do to get a good score, and then look at your experiences. Then look at other things you, you want to do, uh, so that you make sure that you um, that you do well on it. So I'm sorry. And Can you also? Oh. Sorry, I was just going to say really quickly, going back to Mr. Davis asking about um, how important I thought the practice exams were, that's very, very indicative of how you're going to do on the actual test. So if you're taking a practice, a full length practice test, and you're getting, you know, 10, 15 points off of your score, uh, and you're within a few weeks of taking it, or even if you're like five points away, and you you really want to hit this mark, um, and you're a couple weeks, even a few weeks away from taking your actual test, don't hesitate to re, uh, reschedule it because um, at the end of the day, you know, you'll read these crazy accounts on Reddit or on Student Doctor where they're like, oh, I got a, you know, 502 on my practice one. And then I jumped up to a 514 on my test day. That's just not going to happen. Of course, there's little flukes of people, but you you can't hang on those off the wall one off stories um, because that's kind of like it's showing your performance on it. And if you do need a little bit more time even to learn how to take the test. Um, and it's okay if you go into studying for the MCAT or you come out of undergraduate, not being a very strong test taker. That doesn't mean you don't know the material. That doesn't mean um, this isn't a field that you should be pursuing. Um, I am a second year in medical school and I am still figuring out the perfect way for me to study. I'm still changing my regimen. Um, Dr. Wagner is my mentor, so she knows that I do this all the time. Um, so really just adapting and not um, not being focused on like, oh, I can't score as well as my peers. I can't do this. I can't do that. It's not necessarily your knowledge base. A lot of the time, it's just how you approach question stems, how you eliminate answer choices. I, know I would also. You, I was going to say, you've been asked if we would touch on. Yeah, that I, would, I was going to talk about that. Um, yeah, we we do see all your scores. We see how many times you took it, and we see the breakdown. We look for trends. Everybody gets to have a bad day. Um, for me personally, 
you wouldn't have gotten your undergraduate grades if I didn't expect to see good MCAT scores in the biological sciences or the chemical sciences. So a lot of times for me, the one I want to look at is I want to look at the one that's about critical reasoning because my life as a physician is all about clinical reasoning. I have to be able to look at all the things that make a patient unique, figure out how to best take care of that individual patient. So I, but again, it's not any, I'm not going to tell you there's a number. It's more of trends. If somebody's taken it more than once, did they go up versus down? Um, and if somebody's number is really low, sometimes that makes me think about it, but then I'm going to look at the interview. I'm going to see how they interview and how they answer questions. Again, everybody's allowed to have a bad day. So sometimes it's, it, it does have impact. It doesn't have as much impact as people think it does. Yeah, I, I would also add, and, and this is going to go for everything. Please, please, please do not seek advice from random anonymous people on the internet, no matter what, what forum you're looking at. If you have questions about how to get into medical school, contact admissions people at those schools. Even current students, as much as we love them, well, Sally's an exception, she's because of her role, but almost all the students probably don't have any idea how they got into medical school. They don't know the decision-making process on, on the back end. So seek out the admissions folks. We're paid to be available to talk to you, to communicate with you. Now, it doesn't mean you can call us and talk to us anytime you want. Send an email, set up an appointment. We'll communicate with you. That said, there is very, very, very bad advice that has been circulated more than once on the internet about the MCAT. And, you know, if you choose to take the MCAT, the formal MCAT, as a test to see how you'll do, please have somebody kick you right now. Because that is a very bad decision. Do not take the MCAT unless you are prepared to take the MCAT. Because as Dr. Wagner's mentioned, we will see all of your scores. And, and while, while one bad score may not be enough to keep you out of medical school, a pattern of bad scores will be. So take the practice exams, study, do what you need to do. When you are getting scores on the practice exams that you are happy with, then is the time to actually schedule and take the real thing. Understanding, there's probably a five or so point difference between your, your practice exam scores and your real score. And rumor mills run rampant and they thrive on your unhappiness. So be careful of those. Um, as someone who teaches and I'm, I'm looking at talking to people like Sally and Huzefa now as they start thinking about their boards next semester and how they have to prep for them. Taking timed exams so that you can simulate the environment to the best of your ability is critical. I find that I advise students not just to turn the time, you know, do the timed versions, but set yourself in an environment. If all I'm allowed to have in the room with me on, on the board exam, the same thing would apply to an MCAT. If all I'm allowed to bring in is a bottle of water, then put yourself in a room, close the door, put a do not disturb sign on for the rest of the roommates and the family, take your bottle of water and go take your practice test simulate what's it going to feel like. Oh, I have to go to the restroom. All right. So to go to the restroom, I'm going to have to remember to turn off the timer and, and but the clock's still tick, you know, or I don't get to turn off the timer. The clock's still ticking. Understand how the exam is given and try and simulate that environment. I can't stress enough how important that is because on that day, you're one big pile of nerves and a simple mistake could cost you minutes or hours. This is another one I want to add. This is a friend that did this all through his studying and practice exams and everything. He was listening to music and uh, they don't let you listen to music. So practice under those conditions as well. Or, or don't lay on your bed too. That's another one too that I've heard people have done. <laughs> yeah. Um, don't lay on your bed. This is a question somebody asked in the when they registered. Um, there, it, uh, there was a rumor that you're limited to where you can practice in the United States as a DO. Can you reiterate that, Dr. It's Wagner? It's a lie. It's a lie. I, let me put lots of exclamation points. It's a lie. You can practice in all 50 states and territories in this country, as well as many other countries. 
not all other countries, mostly because they don't know who we are and what we do. Um, I, I am old enough to remember when the last state in this nation um, welcomed DOs, because so it's in my practice time, which means it's in the last 35 years, and it was the state of Louisiana, and I remember when they started welcoming DOs. But every state in this nation, not only can you practice in it, it's against the law if someone discriminates against you. So they cannot discriminate against you. In California, it's a big issue. Um, we protect students and physicians from any forms of discrimination. And there's currently national legislation going through. It's called the FAIR Act, which is, being des which is designed to, to have federal, the federal government say to residency programs, if you take federal dollars for your hospital, which is Medicare, and you discriminate and make a student take the USMLE when they could have taken just the Comlex, or because they are a DO, not an MD, we'll pull your federal dollars. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna tell the old timers who are running these programs who don't see it as equal because they had some weird experience once in their life where they are misinformed. Now we're gonna involve the people who count the dollars, the CEOs, the CFOs, who are gonna say, oh, you're not gonna risk my hospital's money from Medicare. You're going to make sure you accept everybody fairly. Um, we encur we are encouraging anybody who's interested in osteopathic medicine from students, physicians, future students. If you see that at, if you see that and can vote for it or send comments to your Congress people or senators to get it passed because this is gonna be a huge thing to make it a federal law. But every state in this nation allows practice by DO. And I just want to add a couple of things onto that because, I mean, I could rant about this for a long time, but I will not. Um, I have three things. So my first is the DOMD stigma lives heavily in the pre-med community um, because that's where the cutthroat competition is. When you're a medical student, you really don't view the two as separate things. Uh, a lot of the time when you're an attending, you don't either um, because we are a DO institution and we also have MD physicians on our staff teaching our students as well as DO physicians. Um, and the additional stigma that DO schools are easier to get into than MD schools, you will find throughout your application cycle that that's not true. Um, and also, once you're in the institution, it's not like our curriculum is a ton easier either. It's not like you're like, okay, I'll go DO because I want to coast through medical school because you actually have an additional course where you're learning your OMM skills, whether that's theory or in the lab hands-on learning, um, which does take time and it is an incredible skill that we do learn, but it does take time um, as well as us even like she's uh, Dr. Wagner is mentioning like residency shouldn't um, force any DO students to take the USMLE, but some students do choose to take it and they have the ability to take the USMLE and get good scores and pass all of those requirements without any additional studying of stuff that was outside of our curriculum. It's not like if we want to take the USMLE, we have to go and like sit in on some MD classes at another college um, because that's why the two uh step one exam should be viewed equally because they are testing on the same stuff if anything complex is testing on more. Um, so I just want everyone to kind of let that sink in and not take the, what's a DO? Why are you applying to DO school? You don't think you can get into medical school because at the end of the day, medical school is what's hard to get into. It's not an MD school that's hard to get into. It's medical school in general, which encompasses both. Did we did we do that one justice, Jubin? Because I think you got our, you got our passions flared up. No, no, I I just uh, yeah. I mean, I could tell you that I worked with a lot of DOs in the ER, and I also know there's a DO uh, neurosurgeon um, that I know that I actually used to work with, and so yeah. I mean, the, the but the thing is, the myth is out there, and this is just the only thing I just want to add it to what Sally said is. There is a lot of um, all stars and superstars in chat rooms and social media and Instagram, but, uh, you know, they're not living their life. And so, um, you know, what you do, what you choose to do is for you. And so, you know, don't, you know, if you're seeking people's approval on social media, on post sports, then I would say don't do it, but. I, I would agree with you. There's so negative, negative media 
has a tendency to take over. And it's really, there isn't as much of it as you think. They just talk louder. Um, I'm sure we're probably getting close to ending this, but I love this last comment and the questions. And you can, you'll get this from Sally and Josefa. You'll get it from me as someone who teaches pre-med culture versus medical school culture. Is it collaborative or competitive? There is some, I can't speak to all schools, but I can speak to Toro. There's something that happens on the first day of orientation that literally, I, I don't know if we have pixie dust or what, but it comes in there and it says, poof, you're all here to support each other. There is no need to be competitive. And from our perspective as your teachers, my, the, the metric I should be judged by is that you all do graduate as caring, competent osteopathic physicians. So if I'm going to do my job and this pixie dust that comes in and makes all the students get along, it's amazing. You literally watch the competitive, competitiveness, sorry, go right out the window. It isn't there. I have never seen student groups study together, share information, post things on websites, do preps, do mock things in advance. Everybody works together. It's amazing. Yeah, just to kind of um, reiterate that from a student perspective, going into, um, well, pre-med in general is just a very, very cutthroat competitive. I was not the happiest person in the world being a pre-med, as I'm sure many of you aren't either, because it just is that culture. And for some people, that's just not like the pool that you want to be swimming in. Um, when I got to medical school, I fully thought that it was going to be this crazy, like pre-med on steroids type of situation. Um, and it's really just not. Um, everyone's there going through the same struggles. Um, the amount of resources that are shared, whether it be um, people's personal notes, uh, different online resources, like little heads up of high yield information that people think that might be tested versus might not. Um, I know our cohort has a Discord chat uh, that has like a different tab for each of our uh, different subjects and like relevant things. Um, and people will go on there and be like, hey, don't forget there's a quiz due tonight. Hey, uh, there's an assignment that was a little bit buried if you forgot it or, you know, it was assigned a while ago. Don't forget it's due at 8 a.m. Things like that have just really, I think, pulled the cohort as a whole together and kind of started to brush away, not even started to, but has brushed away that competitive culture because at the end of the day, um, like you want to succeed with your peers that you're studying with the faculty, the clinicians, the professors, whoever it may be within the um, Toro community. And I'm speaking on our school specifically, uh, wants you to succeed, which is why we have so many different platforms and organizations in place to support student success um, in really all aspects. We, um, we want to be cognizant of your time. I, I do want to say on this question though, our interview process weeds out the biggest of the type A personalities. Um, we are not a competitive culture institution across the board. We do not foster that, that, that behavior. And those people, if we don't weed them out, they quickly learn that behavior is not acceptable in our, in our programs. So because we're, we're, we're near, we're actually 15 minutes over where I thought we were going to end, but conversation is always pretty good. I do want to be, uh, I'm gonna, this I'm is stress, just one. Oh, sorry. I was just going to stress 30 seconds. 30 seconds for the three of you, and I, I, I know you can do it, 30 seconds each, one piece of advice you could give people who are who are considering going into medicine right now. 30 seconds, and Dr. Wagner, I'm gonna let you go last because I know that's gonna be a struggle for you to- I was gonna say, did you, wanna let, did you wanna let Juven ask his question first? Yes. Actually, this is the same thing I was just gonna ask is just talk about why medicine is so important to be collaborative and why it starts in med school and not, I think it's starting in medical school as a team based kind of learning environment is because at the end of the day, whatever tiered position you are in a healthcare environment, you need the other people to support you. You need the rest of your team. And that's really just, I know, I know it's a short answer for that, but it is like an objective answer in my opinion, because um, you need your nurses, you need your CNAs, you need your other attendings to even bounce things off of. Um, but I will start with a 30 second thing because if I don't start, I'm going to go over as well. So I need the pressure. Um, but I would say have when you go, when you're starting your journey to go into medicine, figure out your reason why, why you're doing it in general. 
And then take yourself back to that reason, like write it on a post-it note and put it on your wall. Um, Take yourself back to that reasoning of why you even started this journey to begin with, because it's very easy to get burnt out. It's very easy to be studying for 10, 12 hours and just kind of start to resent the whole environment of it, Um, which is when your passions come into play, which is when your community outreach comes into play. And then you are allowing like yourself to then take yourself back to why did I start this? Why am I studying all weekend? Why am I not attending this event? Because I have like a huge exam and a practical on Monday. Um, and that's really what's going to keep you going is what started you in the first place. Uh, so just to touch on the um, question real quick about collaboration. Um, obviously, it's important to begin collaborating as a pre-med because that's just how it's going to be uh, going forward regardless as you're, you know, as a med student, as a doctor, that's what you're going to be doing. Um, no matter what, uh, you're not going to be able to do everything on your own. You're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to rely on, on your colleagues and, and uh, people who are just as smart as you um, to help you along the way. Um, and so, you know, I think we're better together than we are alone. Um, so definitely, um, I would start that now. Um, if I had, you know, just for my 30 second uh, spiel, I guess what I would say is that don't put too much pressure on yourself um, to get to this point because I know so many people um, who were along the same path as me um, and they decided to do something else um, that was happy, you know, that, that was happy for them and, and they're much better off for it. And there's some people who really, really love doing this. So just make sure that this is something that you really want to do and commit to uh, because if you truly enjoy it, it's going to be, it's going to be a great time. Um, I, I, I think we all work very hard. Um, I work very hard, and but I can say that I am having a lot of fun with it. Whether it's in school or out, um, I'm having a great time. Uh, so I definitely encourage you to make sure that this is really what you want to do. If it is, then I promise you, if you put in the work, you will get to where you want to be. Dr. Wagner? Yeah, medicine is a team sport. <clears throat> Uh, medicine's a team sport. That's the, the sole answer to why collaboration is important. It's a team sport. None of us do it alone. As somebody who's a family practitioner, I could not take care of my patients adequately without my specialists. And my specialists all can, are so happy they're not in family medicine and have to know a little bit about everything. Um, and we all work really well collaboratively together. Um, time management, flexibility, self awareness. Those are three big things that you have to have to be a successful medical student. Those are my three big words to have you think about, um, which includes being a self-directed learner and having a growth mindset. But the biggest thing I would say is know when to ask for help and don't be afraid to do it. And you may not even think you're asking for help. It could be something as silly as I cannot imagine, you know, two more years of this. This is just, you know, some students feel some days are hell on earth. There, it's the day. It'll, you'll feel better tomorrow. That's it's called life. Um, and then they do something fun. Like Sally did this past summer. She came to the office with me and saw patients at the end of her first year of medical school. And she got to take care of people. She called test results to patients. She gave them edu medical education on topics that she knew. Yes, yeah, she did it under my supervision, but she did it. And I think if you said to her, what's the biggest thing she took from that? She'd tell you what she said to me, which was totally rejuvenated, totally motivated ready to go again. So just remember to get that when you need it. I, I just sent Dr. Wagner a note reminding her of 30 seconds. It's that's why she <laughs> they talked longer than I did. <laughs> did you? Um I I would add just, you know, I, I'm gonna make it very simple. Know your passion, show your passion, live your passion. If you do those things and everything else will follow in the process. So, you know, thank you all for, uh, for allowing us to come speak with you tonight. Uh, if you have any questions or need additional information, again, as uh, uh, Mr. Afshar just put in the chat, uh, I have a weekly uh, uh, that is dedicated to the that has members of my staff on it. Occasionally we'll have students and some faculty depending on availability, but that is just about every, <laughs> every, uh, uh, Wednesday, it'll be on our the calendar on our website. We'll tell you if there's if, if it's happening or not. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm sorry, Jubin. It's just it's programmed again, Mister. Sorry, um, and, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, 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 Student Doctor Kanemai, Student Doctor Moise, and. Uh, <laughs>